If those things are in any way true, then it is time to act. The system that supports our country's mental health is falling apart, and we can't allow that to happen. We can't wait for someone else to break our fall. If we don't act now, on behalf of ourselves, our communities, and our society as a whole, if we don't speak up about scientific discovery and where we want it to go, if we continue to underestimate our ability to have an impact, we will be overrun by a mismanagement of the coming change. Science can eventually open our eyes to new possibilities that we can't even imagine right now. We need to make sure that this work moves toward not just better science, but better lives. We've lived with limitation long enough. It's time to look ahead. Let's make the future world a place where we cultivate real mental health. We can do it. The journey of healing doesn't begin later or set up from some other point. The journey begins where we are. The healing starts here. Thank you. Tell them my story. I never intended to tell that first story about eating disorders, 
uh, never occurred to me that I would want to, never occurred to me that I would. I started working on a book of essays about women and women's lives in American culture. One of those essays was called Wasted. It, it was published, it won an award, and all of a sudden, things started rolling quite of their own accord. All of a sudden, I was 22, and I had an agent, and I had a book deal, and then I was like, okay, I have to write a book. Right. So, I mean, there's just this, like, bewildering state of, you know, okay, a book is long, a book is a lot of pages, and uh, it's not an article. Like, that, if they wanted me writing, I've been in journalism for years, and I was, I could kick out something in 15 minutes or less and get the graphs in on with why, and blah, blah, blah. This is pre internet, my friends. And so, that's a terrifying thought as well. But the point is, I, I didn't even know I would have a story. I didn't know I was going to be on a mission. I didn't know I was going to have a goal. And the thing about sticking around, as I said in the talk, the thing about staying alive is one's goal transforms and kind of unfolds and becomes a different goal and evolves. We evolve and our lives evolve, our intellectual lives, our creative lives, our work lives evolve. And um, so what I meant to do when I set out was um, be a snappy Sally Ride Girl reporter. Is anybody old enough to remember that comic strip? Um, Sally Ride Girl reporter, so my dad called me. And, uh, and then the world changed profoundly. And, um, and now there's, there are more urgent things for me to be attended to with the skills and the beliefs that I have. And so I'd love to go back into political reporting because it's a rush. But that's all I need. Um, <laughs> so, um, so it's important that I get to, that I, it's, I think it's all, yeah, so critical for all of us to identify where is our passion. Diane and I were talking about that this afternoon. Where'd she go? Um, oh, there you are. We were talking about, you know, what is your passion and how do you live that out? And I think the fact is that we so often limit ourselves, and this is not true just of people with mental illness, but it is true of people with mental illness. We are so often told, well, now be realistic. Well, now put a lid on that. You don't want to be thinking that. Yeah, bit. You know, I mean, can I go hiking in Africa? Probably not in hospitals. It would be hard to take all those meds. But maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll go hiking in Africa when I'm 85. I have no idea. There's no, there's no need and no sense in Keeping a lid on my dreams, absolutely not. I had a great dream the other night. I dreamed I was flying a hula hoop. I've never had a flying dream before. I was like, and so there's this great hula hoop dream, and I woke up laughing. I used to wake up crying. I used to wake up screaming. It was a different life. And this is different now. I get to dream about flying a hula hoop. <laughs> Anybody? Yes? Can you talk a little bit about your family's role in any recovery and what you think families should be doing? Absolutely. The question is, <coughs> What is my what was my family doing in uh, recovery? Kind of what is the role of families in recovery process? Um, my family uh, is truly large and weird, and so they had, as my mother said once, she said, "You keep expanding the boundaries of normal to keep your kid in." And so I was like, "That's kind of terrifying because you know you don't you don't want your kid to be sick. You just so desperately want them to be healthy." You, the, the words failure to thrive, I think, sent a cold shiver down most parents' spine. And when you have a kid who is literally refusing to thrive, just stubbornly sitting there refusing to thrive, as in a case of eating disorders, and then when you realize that for a lot of us, for me certainly, that unfolded into, this isn't really about the eating disorder. This is about something deeply, inherently wounded that's going to need healing. And so if we can think of these things as in our families as wounds that need healing and not things that need fixing, that's critical. Because it's hard to fix things that aren't broken. And I'm not, to the best of my knowledge, but I do have some wounds from the way that I came into the world, the combination of experience, biology, genetics, this whole confluence of what the mind actually is. What families need to do is be open. I mean, keep saying, open up, wrench open that chest, and kind of be open to like, this is scary, it seems scary, it's not as scary as you think. Is it a life and death thing? Sure. But that's life. I mean, it's, it's important that families recognize that they have a role, that they get to define their own limits, that they can be helpful, and that they don't need to take care of us unless we're under 18, in which case they do. But for those of us who deal with adult mental health concerns, the family is so often just stricken with a sense of guilt, responsibility, and frustration, and helplessness. And that is crushing. That is crushing. You don't need to feel that way. You don't need to feel that way. These are individuals, they are, they are, in most cases, adults who really can define and choose differently when they're ready. And they will. They will. So having that faith, have that hope. Hang on, but have hope. Yes? I was wondering, um, I'm in the mental health and addiction field, and I was wondering how much of your um, process of recovery and help was psychiatry, how much was it you, you know, did you find this, you know, psychiatrist that 
It was definitely coming from, it was one of those periods of time where when I lacked motivation or insight or any number of things that I needed, other people had those things that sort of filled in for me. Um, I got very lucky in that I was, that, that little minor psychotic break I read you uh, a little passage about, I, I landed. The closest hospital, hospital was under the care of one Dr. Lenz, who is my doctor still. And he's about to retire, and he's got hearing aids. I'm like, you can't retire. He's like, but you're fine. And I was like, well, but you can't just, you can't just, you can't just. He goes, but you're fine. And you will have a new doctor, and it will be fine. And I realized, he's right. He's right. There are talented, talented, skilled people. It's not a magical relationship with, with this doctor who knew how to fix me. It took him 10 years to get me medications that were going to work. And so he worked really hard. I worked really hard. Medications helped inordinately. Um, so did meditation. You know, there's, there's, oh, who is that? That's that soft through, does anybody know the 11th step? Soft through prayer and meditation to occur in conscious contact with God as we understood him. And uh, a lot of us misspeak that in meetings, in 12 step meetings, and say soft through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact <laughs> And so uh, and that kind of glances and you're like, what? And so, but the thing, the thing is that it's no one thing, but there is a, you know, it's like a two-legged race, except that it's like an eight-legged race, and you're all trying to get to the same place, and none of you are in the same place at any given time. Me, my doctor, my brain, my body, all of these things are a little cabin a lot of the time. That's the problem with being human beings, is that we're all 